As I went down in the river to pray, studying about that good old way, and who shall wear the starry crown? Good Lord, show me the way. Hi everyone, welcome to my channel, Profess Protest. I'm Audrey, and as you can see by the headline, today's topic is about my testimony, my own personal testimony about how Jesus saved me. And as you can see, I'm Jewish. I grew up Jewish with Jewish traditions. And um, of course, as a Jew, you don't know Jesus. From very little, I started going to synagogue. And where I lived, uh, synagogues aren't, weren't that popular in the North, or, or at least where I was. And it was 45 minutes to go in the city to go there. So I actually stopped going to synagogue about five years old. My mom was a single mom, so it was really hard for her commuting. So she did what she could to be able to give us religion and everything like that. And the main things I took out of it as a kid were uh, mitzvahs, which is a Jewish term for doing good works. And a mitzvah is very looked good upon in the Jewish community. It's something where you just, you do, you do good things to help other people, but not for yourself, but you, you do very selfless acts for people. And it's something that you need. And it's something that, you know, at the end of your life, you weigh your good deeds and your bad deeds. And the mitzvahs should always outweigh what you did bad. And as long as it outweighs that, you are good, you are safe, and you will make it to heaven. And heaven and hell, like the afterlife, wasn't a huge topic. It's more about what you're doing now today on earth. But yes, heaven and hell, like it, it's, a, it's actually also at the same time a big topic because in the Jewish community, everybody has a different perspective, which always made it confusing on how they would view heaven and hell. And the way I was taught is that hell, you have it for, it's called Sheol. And you're there for 11 months. And it's a purification period. And it's for all the sins that you did do on earth. But you have a second chance after 11 months, God will check your heart and make sure, you know, he, he really knows if you're really sorry. If you're really sorry after suffering for 11 months, you get to move on to one of the levels in heaven. They have several levels, the closest one being to God and the furthest way being, you know, you didn't do good. And some people believe that's actually hell. And so that was my perspective on hell and everything. And, and Satan, you know, wasn't even really talked about. There was nothing about that at all. It was just nothing, you know, I wasn't warned um, about any of that, just basically just do more good deeds than you do bad, because we're all going to do bad things. But at the end of your day, as long as you're good, outweigh your bad, you're good. And so that was the main teaching. So at about 12 years old, I moved from the north to the Bible Belt, which I was a super minority. And I thought I was a minority before where I lived in Rhode Island. But no, in the, in the south, you're a true minority when it comes to your religious out views, looks, and beliefs. And so, you know, I started school and naturally everybody was talking and a lot of things that came up were about church and, you know, and if, and I got invited if I wanted to go to church with some girls and I kindly declined. I was like, no, I was like, I'm sorry, I'm Jewish. I don't believe in that. And they looked at me and they told me, you know, you're going to go to hell. And I was just kind of like, I, I'd never really been told that before. And I was like, I'm gonna go to hell. And I was like, I, I've been good. I, I'm not gonna go to hell. And you got to mind you, you know, I'm 12. And this is very, you know, upsetting for me. And I remember going home to my mom, and I actually cried. And I told her, I, I'm gonna go to hell unless I accept Jesus Christ as my savior. And I remember another time my mom had a friend over and her daughter was here. And she told me the same thing. She was like, if you don't accept Jesus, you're going to hell. And I remember staying up all night, just really scared. Just like, why is everybody keep telling me that I'm going to go to hell? I felt like a pretty good person. I, I knew I wasn't perfect, but I mean, who who is? So in my head, just couldn't understand why, you know, if I was being a good person, everything. And, you know, sometimes I, I would see, you know, Christians act very unchristian like So in my head, I was like, so they can act like that but they're going to go to heaven because they believe in Jesus. But if I'm nice and treat people nicer, but don't believe in Jesus, even though I'm not perfect, never claiming I am, that I will go to hell just for that. It just, it didn't make sense. And my mom sat down and talked to me and she reinforced, she's like, no, Audrey, she's like, they remember Jesus is a messenger. They believe, you know, that's their Messiah. But as we are taught, our Messiah is going to end world peace. And she was like, look around. There's no world's peace because I was considering accepting Jesus as my savior because how scared I was. And my mom told me you should never accept anything because you're scared or forced into it. She's like, that's that's not the way it works. And 
she basically just reinforced to me that's why Christianity is a bad thing and how they force people, scare people into it, and they're hypocritical, which as I was growing up, I started seeing more of. Not that anybody's supposed to be perfect, but, you know, people would preach at me stuff, and then I'd see how they would treat people and act, and it just, it didn't make sense for me. And being Jewish, that's really, it was really impactful seeing somebody who claims to be Christian, calling themselves Christian, walking around and doing, you know, different things that weren't like that, and it just made me it turned off to the religion generally. So after my mom had that talk to me, I felt better. And I was like, you know, I'm reassured in my faith. So years go on down the road and we become very secular. We don't go to synagogue. We stop our prayers. You know, we weren't super religious growing up by I me. Mean, we had some of the religion, you know, we, we practice certain things. And so when that stopped happening, I started soul seeking and looking towards other religions and other, you know, spiritual ways that, you know, could help connect me to God because I knew God was real. I just, I didn't know which teaching was a teaching for me. It just, I, I wasn't sure. And I didn't want to settle with Judaism just because I was brought up like that. I really wanted to see for myself. And that brings me to a quote in the chapter of Matthew, Matthew 7, verse 7, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find and knock and it will be open to you. And this is kind of the road that I went down was seeking. And it wasn't anything that, you know, I found automatically, I had to actually seek, I went through believing, you know, I, I started looking into I didn't dabble into witchcraft or anything like that. But Harry Potter, I know, intrigued me and I used to kind of fantasize about, wow, what would be like to be a witch? And I remember um, doing a Ouija board before and watching it move and not understanding if it was real or not, because it's just, it, it, it didn't click with me. And I really always felt like people were lying and moving it, the board itself. And so I didn't really understand what I was doing. And I had tarot card reading at one of my friend's houses. His mom gave it to me and like he did, she did the tarot card reading and it was so fascinating and it seemed pretty real for me. And so I started wanting to check out books on, you know, witchcraft. I remember there was a spell book that I found in one of the libraries down the road from me when I was younger. And I was going to check it out. Like, I remember pulling out the book. And I was really excited. And I was like, you know, this is probably going to be cool. It's, pro it's probably fake, but I just want to check just to see. You know, I just, you never know. And as I pulled out the book, I had a really bad feeling in my gut. I don't know what it was. This is before I knew anything. I just had this really turning feeling and I was kind of just looking at it and it, and you know, I was like, you know, it's fake. It's, it's in library. It's just a spell book, you know? And as far as I was concerned, you know, it was a very real spell book. And I understand that people can put out stuff, but for me, it was very much real. So it just, I don't know. It just like when I touched and pulled it out, I, I had a feeling just not to even open it, like telling me not to open it. And I couldn't understand what that was in my head. I was like, I was just intuition. Maybe there's something wrong with this. Maybe I shouldn't do it. It's just, you know, it's me. I'm just you know, scaredy cat, have anxiety. So it, it has to just be that. So I put it back. Thank God I put it back. Um, and so I kind of moved on from that searching from, you know, spells and witchcraft, which I'm really happy about. But then now I get into agnosticism and slightly, you know, I, I looked into atheism too, and it kind of brought me down a very weird path as I was about probably four, 15, 16 ish. And I really started getting involved with like looking up things about ancient aliens from History Channel really intrigued me and how I looked into how the pyramids had paintings of aliens and things that, you know, have been throughout all history has stayed same. And I remember how in the Bible, it doesn't tell you anything about that. And I think, you know, as a God, you know, he would want us to know about aliens, you know, it just, it didn't make sense. And that kind of brought me towards, you know, agnostic, not believing in any of these things out here where I was slightly almost got to the point where I was an atheist. I just started to believe, you know what, there, there can't be a God right now. Is this, this is, you know, just, it does make sense from everything, I guess, that was the seeing the world that how people were suffering and the hate crimes that went along with religion that claimed to be peace, but a lot of killing in it in the name of it. And the fact that there's aliens that's not mentioned in any of them, it's just, it really didn't make sense. And so I started digging into that. I got obsessed with looking up alien testimonies, alien stories, things on YouTube where people have been abducted. And it definitely wasn't something that what it was. It wasn't an alien. It wasn't anything like that. And I just remember 
it was the most amazing thing. I came across a podcast and this person said that when she cried out for the name of Jesus, when she was getting abducted, she was thrown back into her bed and saved. And that was the first one out of tons and tons and tons of ones I looked at. And it didn't make sense to me. I was like, how does Jesus have anything to do with aliens? I didn't even believe in Jesus at this point. I didn't believe in anything, let alone Jesus. And it just... I was like, okay. I was like, it's weird. I was like, all right. So I start typing in people who had alien abductions, um, which I'm not saying I don't believe in aliens, but they're not aliens. I, I know what they are now, but I'll get into that in a few minutes. They're not aliens, but they are real, these entities, and it's talked about in the Bible. But, you know, I start typing in testimonies where aliens and stuff were abducting people and all the people that you know I did see that cried out for Jesus and how they're automatically protected and thrown and he took his arms around them and just protected them from these scary you know interdimensional beings as what I've seen I've come to learn and so it just it didn't make sense there was like hundreds of testimonies things articles aligned from people um and it was like I was looking at all the wrong areas so right there I started getting fascinated with the fact that Jesus saved them from these entity entities. And then I started thinking, you know, I, I read some stuff online that, you know, false stuff. They're saying, you know, aliens made the Bible and they probably created Jesus too. And all this horrible stuff to deceive me and so many people. I thought about it as a possibility, but it still just didn't make sense. Why would these aliens be so scared of Jesus if they made him? Why are they so scared? What is it that I don't understand that Jesus has this place and authority that they have to listen to him. So I started typing in the Bible, you know, who is Jesus? I wanted to see from a biblical standpoint of view, not from what I've seen from people. And, you know, and it's not like I'm judging that every Christian was like this because I know some wonderful, many wonderful Christians and we, nobody's perfect, nobody's perfect. But it's just, I was led astray by a couple of false Christians. What seems to happen before you know the Lord, you don't know how to discern true Christians from fake Christians, what you learn as you study the word. And that's something that I was never aware of because obviously it was never talked about warned and I didn't have spiritual discernment. I didn't have Jesus with me to understand that type of stuff yet. But so I, I started looking into the Bible about who Jesus was and I wanted the biblical standpoint view, not my mom's, not my relatives who are Jewish, not, you know, Christians down the road. I just felt it would be best for me to see it myself. And so I started reading about how he died on the cross. And I remember I knew a little bit about that. I didn't really understand, you know, why somebody would have to brutally in my head die on the cross for everybody. It just didn't make sense. But when I started reading in the chapter, like how he did this because it was a selfless act of love. It, it was never understood to me. That's what was to me. It looked like a sacrifice, not like a love sacrifice. And even if you said that without actually reading the word of God, it's hard to understand, but Jesus actually did it out of something, um, just, just love, just protection and God, you know, God, he came in the flesh and he died on the cross for our sins. It was just, phenomenal when you read the chapter about it how everything he did and it wasn't because you know god needed to kill somebody jesus volunteered to do this and have because jesus has been there since the beginning of the time he's the son of god but he is of god and equal to god and it's the holy trinity and you don't know discernment until you actually open the bible and start really reading it and finding out for yourself who he is and with reading it you start to see that everything Jesus did was for us. This wasn't a brutal sacrifice. Yes, it was brutal what happened to him, and it was the ultimate sacrifice. But he did this to put an end to our death that was going to be coming. And where your death leads you to was sin, because sin is death. And Jesus did this to take away, his blood purifies us to make us clean again so we can enter heaven. Not that we'll be perfect, but that we have a chance to repent. We have a chance to see his ways. He came down here to show what it's supposed to look like, how we're supposed to act and the relationship God wants with us. He was here to show us that and it was very impactful. So from there, I still had questions, even though I had read this, it really hit my heart. And I was like, wow, it's amazing. But I brought it to my family and of course they told me, you know, Oh, you know, it's it's because you're in the Bible Belt. It's getting to you. Don't let the Christians scare you in. And 
tell you false doctrine to get you to convert and you're born Jewish, you should be proud of that, you know, proud Jewish heritage stuff it's you grow up with and Jewish guilt. There's a lot of Jewish guilt. That's people who are watching who are of Jewish origin, you, you know what I'm talking about, that Jewish guilt. But so my mom laid a ton of that on me and I love my mom very much. I respect her very much. She was a single mom and I just wanted to make her happy. So I kind of backed off once I saw how hurt she was. I backed off and then I saw, you know, my relatives, everybody else were like, oh, about me wanting to know Jesus. And my mom kept claiming that's not true if I'm just doing it because I'm scared into doing it. So at that point, I was just very much confused. So I backed off of it for quite some time. And then I also remember having slight, you know, after everything had happened, like a year or two, fast forward, um, I start having experiences of severe anxiety. Like I feel, I always felt like, a cloud over me and it, it always may feel like somebody's behind me like almost like a paranoia stuff like I always felt very oppressed and there was somebody about to break in something bad about to happen but I could never pinpoint why I always felt like this and then I started trying to seek help to wonder if it was my anxiety getting out of control or what was going on and of course I was told it was anxiety and I go home learn techniques to cope with it kind of stuff and just like, all right, you know, I have to get a hold of myself. And then I started having supernatural things happen. There was a point after, you know, I got married and I had kids and stuff. Uh, when my twins were young, one of their little um, bumbo seats, whatever they're called, um, seats they send to eat. It actually, and I, I ran to tell my husband, he, he was agnostic, not atheist, but he was agnostic and he used to be a Christian. So he, he ended up being agnostic, which also didn't help influence me anymore you know towards anything because from his perspective he was christian and it just didn't work out for him because for his reason the hypocriticalness inside the church it just it led him away and didn't make sense or <clears throat> sorry it didn't make sense and so that's kind of like what he told me and so of course that didn't edify me with it anymore but i told him that when i was downstairs cleaning and he was upstairs um taking care of the kids i turned around i saw one of the seats shaking like this just shaking and it was doing it for like three seconds and I almost couldn't believe what I had seen so I ran upstairs and went to go tell him and he kept telling me you know reassuring me that I'm just seeing things you're just you're over imaginative you know how you get you have anxiety you know and I mean anxiety is very real but this was something at a different level at this point and I, I called my mom and I told her what happened and at this time my papa had just passed away and she told me that was my papa tra probably trying to communicate with me and just to let me know he was all right because my mom always told my grandfather um, he was an atheist, but, you know, he grew up Jewish and everything. He's just he, atheist. But um, if there was life after death to come back and prove it and let her know. And so I, I took it and I was like, you know, it's Papa. I was like, it has to be Papa. And so I just took it and ran with it. And then fast forward, you know, a month later, I'm clean dishes and my I hear something vibrating near the door like something loud and it was very abrupt and I put down a dish and I went to go see what it was and by the door was one of my weave remotes on a table and it was shaking back and forth and the table wasn't shaking the lamp wasn't shaking just the weave remote and I was like okay you know I'm just I you know papa go away if it's you go towards the light go because that's what my grandma would always teach me to say and so it stopped and then later, as I'm sitting down after vacuuming, I put the kids to bed, I hear something drop in the kitchen. And I go in, and it's an M&M. &M. And I know sensory is just very random, it's M&M. &M. And then I pick it up, and I go sit back down. Something drops again. It's another M&M. &M. And I don't even know where these M&Ms are coming from. Probably something, you know, maybe had on the floor, I sweeped up or something. But they're just dropping. It didn't make sense. And I was like, Papa, I was like, if you know this is me. I have anxiety. I love you, but please go. You're scaring me. And if you know me, this is not okay. And as much as I love you, you need to go out of here because I'm basically about to kill over from a heart attack. I was freaking out. And at that time, my husband was on night shift. So this was even worse. It was just, it was so bad. And I remember now here's next month. I think Papa left, you know, I, th I thought he left. So go lay down my room as I shut all lights and my blinds, they fall and they make a huge crashing noise. And they're, and I stood up and I looked around and all I see is like, peering out black window and it was such a creepy unsettling viewpoint it was just awful I felt total terror and I jumped and like I screamed I turned the lights I looked at everything I went to the wall to check the screws everything everything was tight in there and the thing like literally just had 
popped off, fell down. And the next morning, my husband came home. I had him look at it just to prove to me that it didn't just pop off the wall because he told me that, you know, things fall off the wall. And I get that. I understand things aren't sturdy. I understand that. I'm a pretty rational, logical thinking person. So I was like, okay, that, that's true. So when he went to go look at it, he could tell that this was something that he can't make sense of. It was like the heavy blinds, like the thick blinds. It just doesn't make sense because it was put on there very well. It's like a snap and push one. It doesn't make sense how it just, the blinds flung down and fell down. And he also understood that. He was like, you know, it must be your papa. It must be because he, he believed in this afterlife spiritually, but he wasn't sure what exactly he believed in with stuff like that. And so we both, you know, decided, you know, it's just, it's off. And I told him I couldn't settle for the point that's Papa because Papa would keep doing this to me. And as we went downstairs um, and he was standing over the lights, and I walked in the kitchen. He told me the lights were fluttering on and off. And when I walked back in there, the lights were normal. And he was like, no, it was like, seriously, they're flickering on and off. And it was in a pattern that it wasn't like we need a new light bulb, like something's up. And so I started typing and stuff with poltergeist and then demons came up. And I was very unfamiliar with demons. I was, I, I didn't look at that part of the Bible yet. It wasn't something that I looked into too crazy. So I started looking up what is a demon and wh what does God define a demon? And it's a disembodied spirit. And I looked up how God says, when we die, our souls go back to him. They don't stay around earth. They don't hang around. And I thought all times that then where's Papa? And then I was looking in the Christian Bible. I was like, so by what, you know, Jesus says, you know, we, in the Old Testament too, you know, we, we go right back to God and in the New Testament, you know, you, you don't stick around earth. There, there's never been a time where we actually ever have, we don't just float around and we're ghosts and, you know, and I've heard a lot of ghost stories where people take on images. And I thought, yeah, it must have been that little girl died down the street and she was just haunting the house, but it's not the case. Only things that live on earth are disembodied spirits, which God defines as demons. And we, when we die and our soul separates from the temple of God, we go back to God for judgment. We don't stick around here. There's no purgatory. There's no in between. We go right back to God. So automatically I knew, I was like, you know, that's not Papa. I just, I knew it. I knew it was not my Papa. And I, and what I was reading in the Bible made sense. And I never really heard of demons. I've heard poltergeists and all these bad things, but demons was really something that was never talked about. And I was looking up, you know, demonic, oppression signs and stuff and everything it was like boom 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 all demonic and my husband was also suffering from sleep paralysis at this time which was that's a whole nother testimony that i'm gonna do but he had to the point a demon speaking to him actually the demon breathed on his neck and said his name and he couldn't move he couldn't see it but he heard him and he felt his breath and it was a demonic voice and a little bit after this you know we end up moving and buying our first house. And we felt like, you know, maybe they stay where they're at. Maybe they don't follow. Maybe they don't, you know, come with us. So, you know, I still wasn't too sure about it, but so we move and we get a new place. And so Demok stuff stops and then it starts up again. And then something else happens with my husband with sleep paralysis, which I'm not going to tell because I would bear him give his own testimony on you know, a different time. So he could really in depth tell you because I was not the one who went through it, but I think it would be very beneficial for you guys to understand how real stuff like this is. And so I looked up how to get rid of demons. And the only way you can get rid of a demon is if you believe in Jesus, because Jesus gives all authority that he has to you, the believer, and where you're able to trample on serpents. And not that we should ever be too excited about or, or happy that we have the story, but be happy that we're written in the book of life. And that's something that, you know, I've, I've learned now and I'm still learning every day in my walk. So I got on my hands and knees and did Sarah's prayer because I really believe this stuff was happening. And I start praying about, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus, get out in the name of Jesus. I was like, Lord, I plead the blood of Jesus over this house. I was like, protect my kids, protect me, protect my husband, everything. And lo and behold, everything, it, it, it was insane. It was just so cleansing. It was like the, the negative energy from the demons that you can feel when you're feeling oppressed and anxiety and paranoid, it felt relieved. I was re replaced with joy, peace, good things. And it's not that I was fully sure that Jesus was my Lord and Savior at the time. It's just the peace I had with us when I spoke these words that really 
spoke to me and it was almost a way of him revealing himself to me and what he did is to use my seeking like he's he promised he's faithful if you seek you shall find and I was seeking and it just made sense so over the next year you know I, I didn't go to church yet I was still very lukewarm worldly and you know I still have certain struggles today and my walk of life where I'm trying to constantly improve on I'm definitely not saying I'm perfect yet, but I'm definitely getting a stronger relationship with God and Jesus all the time by reading the word, trying to understand it, applying it to my life. Not so I'm just saying it, but so I'm walking the way Christ would like me to walk. So I could be a good, good example to my children, to my friends, to people, especially if I hold the title that I consider myself Christian. I want to make sure I live up to that. And that's a big thing too. But so over the next year, you know, I fell back into sin and I was doing good for a while. And you know, still enjoying just like sinful stuff that, you know, people consider normal today. But um, it just, I, I fell off an even deeper path. I even got worse and I got very depressed and my anxiety kind of really took over me. And it was just, it was really hard times. And I took it out on people I loved and, you know, I was just having like irrational anger and I just didn't know what was wrong with me. I just didn't, I felt like I could never feel complete. I never felt fully satisfied with anything. I felt like there was always something else I needed to find to fill that hole in me. And even though I was happy and I loved my husband, my kids, I just, I felt such a need to find, uh, I don't know how to put it, just, you, you know how before you knew Jesus that you, you just, you felt something was always missing. You never felt that full peace and joy that you have known Jesus. And that within itself is such a testimony. And I tried, people tried saying, you know, it's what you think it's in your head in my Jewish family, you know, but it's really not in your head. It's it's not like I just, I was raised up, you know, because I know a lot of people say, well, if you're raised Christian, you're brainwashed. And that's not true. But I know from outside looking in, you can at least look at my perspective. I wasn't even raised that way. And that's how real Jesus is. He really grabs people out of anything. If you're seeking, he will find you. And even my husband now, he's, uh, he's, he's completely back to being a born again Christian. He got rebaptized. He's a believer again and a believer like he never was before. He wasn't really explained growing up what it meant to be a Christian. And for that, for him, that was very confusing. It was never anything that was much talk about in the family. It was left on Sunday and that's it. And that's very confusing to people who, when you're a child and you're growing up. So a lot of people, if, if you're not doing it and walking of it every day of your life, then it's hard for your kids to take it seriously. And that's something that also I take from his testimony to do for our kids to make sure we're living more of a lifestyle, not just a say, not just claim, not just a belief, a, just a way of life in itself. But everything that happened, it was very, very supernatural. And then also, and as I was in sin again, like, you know, drinking with my girls, going out, having fun every now and then. Don't, I don't go out much because I'm always home with the kids, but a few times my husband, you know, will watch the kids or something, or I have a girl's night in and let the girls over and do all the stuff that, you know, we do, just chill and just worldly talk, gossip, you know, just, just what you do. And I remember falling asleep one night and I had a dream. And this was the dream really where Jesus revealed himself to me. I had a dream that there was two rows and we're walking towards our end. And it was a really confusing dream. So we're all wearing shirts. I was wearing blue shirts. Like I was in a crowd and we're walking in line wearing blue shirts. And it wasn't like a neat organized ground or um, organized walk or whatever. It was just like everybody's kind of like everywhere, but we're divided by these people and we couldn't go over near them. But I remember thinking I was wearing my blue shirt and I was just like um, looking at the people in the colored shirts, whatever they're wearing, and they're all bright and pretty colors. And I was just like, well, they're on the wrong side. I know I got it. I know I did good. And that's what my dream. I didn't know what I was looking forward to. I just knew that I did. I was like, yep, I did well. I did great. And uh, wherever they're going, it's not going to be where we're going because at least, you know, we're all matching. It has to be good. I looked down at my shirt and there was something written on. I can't quite remember now, but it was something along the lines of, you know, no salvation, not saved, something that was very like, what? Like it wasn't there before I looked down and, and it sat my shirt and I realized we're all wearing the same shirts and we're kind of marching and nobody looked happy in my line. All the other people wearing bright colors, really happy walking down this brown boardwalk. And at the end of it was pitch black, nothing. It was just like, almost like the abyss. 
and it was very scary and it was just a horrific feeling and as I started realizing I was on the wrong side and I was on their side and I couldn't go over to their side and that I had to keep moving forward I couldn't stop turn back I had no control over my body I had to keep moving forward the closer I got to this black looking abyss the more scared I got it was the most terrifying dream I have ever had I literally felt just death it felt like you were literally staring death in the face and as we got very close to it and I was right about to go into it, I was praying. I was like, God, oh, please. I was like, don't let me do this. I was like, please don't. I was like, I don't want to go. I was like, I know this is bad. This is very bad. And then something in my head said judgment day. And it was something I can't explain, not like a physical voice, but it was something that popped up in my head in my dream was judgment day. And then right before I was about to hit the black thing, I, I just, I knew I was like, it's judgment day. And I knew I was in the wrong line. I didn't go to the right place. And there was no turning back. I had no control over what happened. And as soon as I got like right up close, like really close and personal with the this black abyss looking stuff, I went into it and it was just like my breath fell out of me. And as my breath left my body, I woke up. And it was such a scary but powerful dream. And this is after I had already started in the word of God, but I wasn't really applying it to my life. I was just kind of living loosely, like stay lukewarm. And... I, I sat down, I started getting a Bible, and I started looking at things, and a chapter, I think James, I can't remember what chapter it was, but I opened up in it, and it said something about, uh, don't lose your salvation once you've already gotten it, don't don't lose what you have done, or what Jesus has done, don't undo it by, after knowing the Lord, going back and turning back into your old ways, because, you know, you, you'll find death, and that will put you in hell, and it like almost opened up to page. I just remember grabbing my Bible and just the KJV is what I use and opened up and it was almost directly right on that. And this was on Sunday too. And I was almost not going to even go to church. And I got up and I actually went to church and I was just like, I I'm going to stop this. I'm going to go because this is a sign. God is speaking to me. Jesus wants me to know to stop it, to cut it out, to get right with him and get right in the word. And I, I started going and then Soon before I know it, I get baptized. I'm proclaiming, you know, that I am saved by Jesus. I tell my family whether they liked it or not. And, you know, my mom was not really happy about it. She's definitely coming around now, but she was not happy. She wasn't that supportive, but she said she will be supportive and she will love me through it regardless. It just upset her to see me do this. But now she's even starting to consider that Jesus may be the Messiah by seeing what he's done in my life and how. I'm so happy in the peace and joy that was non-existent before Jesus. I'm not saying that I was never happy. I was happy, but it was temporary, little, or temporary happiness. It, it didn't last. It didn't stay. And it was something that could be taken away if something bad happened. And the thing with Jesus is it, it's an eternal joy. Joy is something that you constantly have. It's not temporary happiness. It's, it's a joy. Even in sorrow, you have joy because you know he's with you for he will never leave you or forsake you. And Jesus also said in John 14, 6, or John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And it is so true. It's so true. And then there's another verse in John chapter 8, verse 32. And you will know the truth. And the truth will set you free. And it set me free. It's helping set my mom free. It set my husband free. It set us free from demonic bondage. And, you know, it, just, it set us free as in raising our kids to be good seed and to help do more things. It made me want to be a better person. It makes me want to show love and forgiveness to people I'd never showed forgiveness to before. Because I think of all times, if somebody didn't show me forgiveness for all times I've messed up, I mean, just made me more of an open heart person. I don't hold grudges. I I don't want to not forgive. I want to forgive every chance I get. I want to be more understanding. It just, it really makes you see a person's heart instead of what you're just presented to. And I always try to look to the heart before. It's not that I didn't, but it's, it's such a different experience, different outlook that brings you to that. It, it's hard for me to express how how exactly it feels into words because I know how it feels it's just it's an overwhelming feeling and I guess out of this whole testimony I just I hope that if somebody's watching this and sees that if Jesus can pull me out from growing up Jewish to you know being agnostic sort of atheist and then believing in aliens and science and 
all these things that led me completely astray and then going down those rabbit holes then getting you know thinking I'm getting visits from my papa definitely wasn't my papa and trust me no relatives are visiting you guys either if you think it's a relative it's you know look to the ward it, it's it's a demon and I was so big into those medium shows and all that stuff and it's just it's really hard oh and aliens what they are to me they are fallen angels so aliens I forgot to say that earlier in the video I'm sorry it's a little choppy this is my first video I'm going to be putting out here and I will get better as I go and I'll do shorter time testimonies and make shorter videos next time but I just felt like I had a lot to say and it's all really hopes to glorify God and Jesus and just to show it, like I said, if he can do it for me, he can do it for you. There's, you know, I, I'm not special and I definitely deserved to go to hell. I, I deserved everything that I would get. And Jesus came here to save me from myself, from my wickedness, from my sins, for the wrong things that I've done. He's, he came here to show me the way and how to live life and how to be a good person. And the forgiveness is overwhelming, the grace that he has for us. And in our iniquities, he, you know, puts us through the refiner and he makes us beautiful and he helps us. And we're never going to be perfect. Christians are never going to be perfect. But as long as you're trying and you're praying in the word of God and you're repenting and you're asking him to be your strength, because we cannot be our own strength for he is our strength and he cares about us and he wants you to pray to him and ask him for help, no matter how small it is. It really, the proof is in the pudding. I mean, and not to even say, you know, even more stuff, the fact that a lot of over like 2000 Bible prophecies, I believe have come true and already come to pass. And that was something too, that no other religion I have seen that has actually had that. And there's a lot of information available on the internet today about that. And just, I, every day I'm a work in progress. I'm still early on my walk. I'm a new born again, um, probably about a year a year, but I've been doing, feel really well. I've been trying to, I've been, it, it's so hard. It is, it is really hard, but it's easy at the same time because with God uplift or upholding you with his righteous right hand, it really, it really helps. And, you know, we're going to have to suffer and take in part of our suffering with like Christ did, but there's joy in it because you know where you're going and it's nothing. And I always tell myself, it's nothing, give up these sins just to have eternity. It's really nothing when you compare it. And if you're having trouble getting over anything with any sins that are holding you bondage, it's probably demonically influenced. And I pray right now in the name of Jesus to break any of those for you guys suffering with any of that, or, you know, it's just hard and I'll continue praying for you guys. I hope you guys continue praying for me. Um, every day is a walk and every day I'm learning, I'm growing in the word and I pray for the Holy Spirit just to help reveal more new things to me. And he has, he's been really working a lot in my life. And I pray that he used me to help edify somebody out here to help, you know, make your, your faith in God stronger. Cause that's what I'm here for. I'm here for all glory be to God and for everything he's done in my life. I just want to be the living testimony of what he can do for you guys too. And until next time, may Yahweh bless you.